It's Sunday morning, and our subject is predestination and atonement. Now, predestination is about a family, particularly about a wife. The wife is the church. There are several names for the wife. She's called a wife, body, church. It's amazing. This word body is the word soma. It's a derivative, a derivative of the word sozo. Sozo is the word saved. So God only saves his body, which is the wife, which is the church. And he's only come to save his family. The Bible says, whom he did foreknow. Well, the husband foreknew his wife. The husband always foreknew his wife in Israel. That was a, a common understood thing. Uh, the father of the bridegroom, the father of the bridegroom, would procure a wife for his son, and he would use, he would employ the services of a friend, Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, and he would buy the wife, he would buy the wife, and give the wife to the son. And the son knew who his wife was before she knew him. So he foreknew her, or he knew her intimately, whom he did foreknow, whom foreknow, prognosco, P-R-O-G-I-N-O-S-K-O, -O, to know, gnosko, beforehand, to know intimately the, the wife that he foreknew, this is the one he's predestined, prohorizo. Prohorizo, pro before, bound, bound, inside the horizo, H-O-R-I-Z-O, -O, and it's our word horizon. A wife has been bound for the light, the light, and that's truth, he that doeth truth cometh to the light. So the wife is bound for the light, and he, God is going to conform her, whom he foreknew he predestined to be conformed. Uh, to be conformed, sumorphos, S-U-M-M-O-R-P-H-O-S, are to be fitly shaped or joined together as one body. Sum means with. So we're all going to be joined together and shaped into the likeness or the icon or the image of his son or the likeness of Jesus. Likeness. And he knew this woman before she ever knew him. And he would go to his wife's house and leave his father's house. And this is a part of my marriage ceremony. And he would meet with her and he would say to her, Let not your heart be troubled. If you believe in my father, believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms and he said, I'm going to go away, and if I go away, I'm going to come again and receive you unto myself. That where I am, that you may be also. Those are words that are usually read at a funeral, but they are a wedding ceremony words. And he was talking to his apostles, his wife, the nucleus of the church, when he said these words in John 14. So he would come and meet her, and he knew her, but she didn't know him. And he would introduce himself to her and say, I am your husband. You have been bought and given to me. And we're bought by the blood of Christ and given to Christ. And he only bought a particular specific wife, a particular wife. It's not everybody in the world or whoever wants to come. It is who wants to come, but where are they going to get the want to? The want to or the will has to come from God. So... If a person has any will, and since there is none that seeketh after God and there's none good, you have to get the will to desire Christ from somewhere other than yourself because you have no goodness in you. There's none good. Nobody seeks God. And he will spend, uh, he will stay with her. He'll introduce himself. And he says, I'm going away. I'm going to come back. And he would come back a year later. 
and come at midnight there in the 25th chapter of Matthew that we see behold a bridegroom cometh at midnight go ye out to meet him and there's five wise and five foolish virgins five wise and five foolish five foolish and they have on their robes of they have on robes but they don't have any light in their they don't have any oil in their lamp and oil is a picture of the Holy Spirit Holy Spirit so while the foolish virgins are going away, the bridegroom comes and only the five wise virgins go out to meet him. And he goes to his father's house. And this year he's gone. He goes back to his father's house and builds a room on his father's house. And he says, I'm taking you to my father's house to live in that room that I have fixed for you. And that was the Jewish ceremony. But he knew her before she knew him. And she was called wife. She was called body. Let's go over there to the fifth chapter of, of Ephesians. I want to look at this again. He, loved, he died for his wife. He did not die for everybody. Well, let me leave church up there. Church. Uh, he didn't die for everybody. He only died for his wife. Look over here in Ephesians 5 and verse 23. For the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church. He's comparing the wife and the church is the same thing. And he is the savior of the body, soma, and it's a derivative of the word sozo. Sozo is the word saved. So he only saves the body. That's all he saves. Therefore, as the church is subject unto Christ, so let the wives be subject unto the husbands and everything. If you notice, he is aligning the church with the wife all through here. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave himself. He died on the cross for it, it says. Of course, we know that the word is A-U-T-A, A-U-T-A-T-A. Anytime you have an A-T-A on the end of a word, or next to the end, A to N, or what we would call E N, uh, A to N, that is always feminine gender. So this is where it says it, that's a bad translation. People say, you know more than the translators of the King James Bible. Well, in this case, I certainly do. Uh, it, it shouldn't be translated it, it should be her. Now, of course, there were half the translators of the King James Bible were Roman Catholic and half of them were Calvinists, so they had this knockdown drag out in the translating room. And they did a lot of compromising. It was probably Roman Catholicism that put it in there instead of her. Now, he died for his wife, the church, that he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word, that he might present it to himself a glorious church, having spot, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So ought men to love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. For no man ever yet... Of course, that word loveth is not the word affection. It's not the word phileo. It's the word agape. For no man ever yet hated his own flesh, but nourisheth and cherisheth it, even as the Lord the church. All through here he's calling the wife the church. For we are members of his body, and he, his body is the wife, members of his body and his flesh and of his bones. For this cause shall a man leave his father and mother and shall be joined unto his wife, and they shall be one flesh. This is a great mystery, but I speak concerning Christ and the church. He says, what I'm talking about is Christ and the church. Nevertheless, let every one of you, in particular, so love his wife, even as himself and the wife see that she reverence her husband. Not be bossed by her husband. Reverence him as he leads her in truth and lays his life down for her. Now, if she's the body, in Ephesians 4... In 4, the Bible says there is one body. Just one body. And this body, the scripture says over here in Colossians, a couple of books over here, in Colossians, the first chapter, in verse 18, he is the head of the body, the church. The body is the church. 
And there's one body, uh, and he speaks of in the body of his flesh in verse 22, and then in verse 24, he speaks of for his body's sake, which is the church, in verse 24. So his body, which is his wife, is the church, and he only died for his wife, his body, the church. He's only saving his body. He didn't die for everybody. The man in hell is dying for himself. Now we're talking about atonement. Let me give you one other thing here. If there's one body, and you look here in Ephesians, the third, the uh, second chapter, Ephesians second chapter. Now, in Ephesians, the second chapter. Hold on, I got my papers won't turn. It's getting old. Excuse me, third chapter, not second chapter. And Paul says, For this cause I, Paul, the prisoner of Jesus Christ, for you Gentiles, if you have heard of the dispensation of the grace of God which is given me to you, how that by revelation he made known unto me the mystery, and he said in Ephesians 5 that the mystery is the church. Of course, it's a mystery. Mystery, musturion, M-U-S-T-E-R-I-O-N, means the facts that are unrevealed I'll get in a minute. It's the things that are unrevealed and revealed apocalypto, A-P-O, K-A-L-U-P-T-O, means to a removal of the cover. So we get the word revelation, ap ap apocalypse, or apocalypsis. We get that word from revealed. And he says here, how that by revelation or taking the cover off, he made known unto me the mystery or the church, as I wrote afore in a few words, whereby when you read you may understand my knowledge in the mystery of Christ. And the mystery of Christ, he tells you what it is, which in other ages was not made known unto the Gentiles, which is a term, sons of men is a term for the Gentiles, as it is now revealed, apocalypto, the cover's taken off, unto his holy apostles and prophets by the Spirit, and here is the mystery that's been revealed, that the Gentiles should be fellow heirs and of the same body, the one body, the church, of the same body as who? As the Jews from the previous chapter, where the Bible says in verse 19 from the previous chapter, Now therefore you are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and the household of God. And that's a reference back to uh, verse 12, that at that time you were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel, but now we're fellow citizens and of the same body as Israel. What if the wife is the church in Isaiah, the 54th chapter, Isaiah 54, the scripture says, verse 5, God speaking to Israel, Thy maker is thy husband. Well, the maker of all things is Christ. In the beginning is the word, the word is with God, and the word was God. All things were made by him, the word, and the word was made flesh and dwelt among us, in verse 14. So, Christ is the word that made all things. He's the maker. He's the husband of Israel, the Bible says here. Well, he's also the husband of the church, isn't he? If he is, and the church is the body, and there's one body, then Israel is the church, the church is Israel. And it's only spiritual, those that are believers in God. There was a lot of Israel that didn't believe God, so they are not all Israel which are of Israel. But the election hath obtained this, and the rest were blinded. So God's church is his body, and that's who he died for. Thy maker is thine husband, the Lord of hosts is his name, and thy redeemer, the Holy One of Israel, the God of the whole earth shall he be called. So the God of the whole earth is the Holy One. And Peter stood in Pentecost in the third chapter of Acts and said, You killed the prince of life, you denied the Holy One and the just. He tells the Pharisees that. So the church is Israel, Israel is the church, the church is the body, the body is the wife, and the believers of the Old Testament were in the church just like the believers of the New, and that's the ones that Jesus died for, no one else. He didn't die for anybody else except his wife. Uh, when God bought a wife and gave to his son, he knew who she was ahead of time. Everybody else... 
They are vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Everybody else are natural brute beasts made to be taken and destroyed. Everybody else are men before of old ordained to this condemnation. And they are the majority of the world because only few will find the narrow way. Do you realize how privileged we are to be the elect of God? I mean, I stop and think about that and I think it could have been, it could have been someone besides me he could have picked somebody else and given me this reprobate mind and made me want to go out here and just live like the devil all my life and never be converted. And he could have fixed my mind not to be his elect. But it was simply his arbitrary choice. Salvation and saved doesn't have anything to do with what you want. It's what God wants in you. That's what it has to do with nothing else. But well, how are you saved? You have to believe, but you can't believe because you can't seek God. If he doesn't put the desire to seek him in you, you will not seek him. Nobody can seek God on their own because we're, none of us are good and none of us seek after God, the Bible says, and we don't have any light in us and we're dead in our sin. And he died for or instead of us in our place as our substitute. He bought us. And he, the scripture says the wages of sin is death. Everybody that is not redeemed or bought back. There's several words. When you teach atonement, when you're talking about atonement, you're talking about the day of atonement, and that was in Israel. And the day of atonement was not for anyone but Israel, the wife, the bride, the body. That was all it was for. When you find the temple here, the temple. There's a picture of the tabernacle in the wilderness. And that was the prototype, the original prototype of Solomon's temple. That's all it was in the wilderness. When they were traveling through the wilderness after they left Egypt and they were given these, Moses was given these instructions. They built this tabernacle. And later on, they built it in the form of Solomon's temple. Well, you have the, here's the veil. Here's the veil. And here's the seven candlesticks and the table of showbread. I don't know how it was shaped. I saw a picture that someone had drawn the other day and it looked like it was hexagonal shaped. <laughs> you know, that's just amazing, isn't it? That's the way it looked, you know. It looked like, of course, that's the Star of David when you have the hexagon. Now, and then, of course, here's the Ark of the Covenant and here is the, there's the, the brazen altar. Here's Solomon's porch. Here's the altar of incense table of showbread, seven candlesticks, and the brazen sea where the priest washed every morning. Now, let me ask you something. On the Day of Atonement, when the high priest, high priest, a son, either Aaron or one of his sons after he's dead, one of his descendants, and the high priest has to come out of Aaron, the older brother of Moses, it has to be a son of Aaron. You can't be a high priest in any other, any other tribe or even in the tribe of Koath, you could not be the tribe of the Levites or the sons of Koath. All the Levites were sons of Levi, but you had to be a son of Aaron in order to be, or a descendant of Aaron to be a high priest. One of these high priests went into the, took, took the blood of a goat on the Day of Atonement and went into the Holy of Holies and sprinkled the blood upon the Ark of the Covenant seven times who was that for? Was it for the Moabites? Were they invited in? Were the people of Ammon invited in? Were the Egyptians invited in? Were the people of Espana, or we call Spain, invited in? Were the Franks, uh, uh, were the Celts settled there in France? Were they invited in? Were the English invited in? Were the, were the people of Galatia invited in? Were the people of Cappadocia invited in? No! It was only for God's Israel, God's body, his wife, the church. That's all. And he was making an atonement for his people and no one else. But you had to be a believer and everybody in Israel didn't believe God. So that's why the scripture says the election hath obtained Israel. God elects certain people. And then after Israel, 
after they go through 500 years of apostasy going after these gods of Baal and Grove and Shemosh and Molech and all the gods of the Zidonians and the gods of the Egyptians and the gods of the Amorites and the Perizzites and the Jebusites, God says, I'll scatter you over the earth. And when they didn't repent, he says, I'm going to blind their eyes and I'm going to pour out my spirit or my truth on all flesh, on the Gentiles, and these are going to be my wife, my bride, and it's going to be the believers. He's got certain Jews that believe, that he put it in their hearts to believe, certain Gentiles that believe. Now we're going to be of the same body as these believing Jews over here in the Old Testament. We're going to be the wife along with them. When the Bible says there in Isaiah 54 that your maker is your husband, well, the maker of all things is Jesus. The Bible repeatedly says that. So if the maker of Old Testament Israel, the believers in Old Testament Israel was Jesus, and if that was their husband, and then Jesus was the husband of the church, there's only one body, only one wife, so we are coupled with these over here as the wife for the bride. The believers over here are not any different than the believers over here. We're the one and the same. We're of the same body, the same wife, aren't we? That's what the Bible says. He only died for Israel, nobody else. When that lamb was offered, when Jesus comes, and we enter in by a new and living way in the New Testament, and our bodies are the temple, know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, and his flesh is the veil, the veil is the flesh, and the flesh is the bread, the scripture says in John 6, and the bread is the body, and the body is the, the church, and the church is the wife, the wife or the bride. It's all one and the same. So, and of course, our hearts are the Ark of the Covenant now because they're sprinkled and the church is the seven candlesticks. They're in Revelation, the first chapter, and the, and the altar of incense. That's the prayers of the saints. In Revelation, the fourth chapter, and we being many are one bread and one body, and now we have an altar that these priests over here couldn't partake of according to that 13th chapter of Hebrews. We have an altar, and that's the daily cross and then there we have a baptism. They were washed every morning at the Brazen Sea. There in the seventh chapter of First Kings where Solomon built the sea. Now we are washed in the blood of Christ. Blood and all of this. We are of the same Israel as these believing people over here. It's not two different Israels. It's not a replacement theology. It's the same Israel. It's the same body, the same wife, and it's a mystery that's been hidden through the ages. We are married to Jesus. We are his wife. That's the betrothed title. And we will be married to him when he comes and takes us out. That's the day you're called the bride. And it's called the bride from then on out. Now, we're talking about atonement. He died for us. Probably one of the most thorough chapters on Atonement is the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. Let's go over there. Isaiah 53. This is a chapter we know as Christians that this is talking about Christ. Now when the Jews who do not believe in Jesus, who do they say this was? This is called by scholars the suffering servant chapter. And that servant is introduced in the 52nd chapter. Now remember when it says chapter 53. That's not in the text. C-H-A-P-T-E-R 5-3 is not in the text. Everything was written on scrolls and they rolled these scrolls out. They roll them up, roll them out. And they'd go from one to the other. The chapter and verse is not in the original text. Chapter 53, verse 3, that's not in the text. It was just one long scrolled letter is what it was. One long exposition. And they knew, those scribes would read that so much in the Pharisees, they knew where those verses were. They could thumb through it like we can, just roll it out and see it. That's how much... They knew the Bible. And that's why Jesus told the Pharisees, search the scriptures for in them you think you have eternal life. And they didn't have to get the scroll out. All they had to do was thumb through their mind. 
because they knew where it was in the scroll. Now, we see this is a picture of the atonement of Christ. Christ was our substitute. There is a doctrine out here. It's called open theism. It is heresy. It is, they, it is a, a doctrine. It is blasphemy. It borders on blasphemy at least. These people that believe this say that Jesus was not our substitute. And this is a very popular doctrine out there in the world. Jesus, they say, he wasn't our substitute and he did not die in our place. What they're doing is they're, they're, they're relieving the wrath of God in this. I believe that what they're trying to say is he died, he died and his blood was sprinkled upon the Ark of the Covenant well, the Ark of the Covenant is our hearts and the law has been broken by us and God has to look through and see the law. The Bible says, The soul that sinneth it shall die. It's talking about in eternity the second death and that the wages of sin is death. So we must die for our sin unless we have someone to do it for us. And we see this suffering servant here in the 53rd chapter of Isaiah. And when you get into the definition of words, you can see that the wrath of God was going to come upon us. And when God in, in eternity past, you can't say eternity past, in eternity, it's the forever now with God. But in eternity, God made provision for us. And he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world for this particular wife, this particular bride, and that's predestination. He's predetermined his wife, his family, his body. What really bothers me about people who don't believe in predestination, I want to ask all of them, do you believe if God is the God of the universe, could he somehow figure out if he actually wanted everyone to go to heaven, could he figure out some way to convince them if he wanted them? Well, God can figure out anything. The part that men don't like about predestination is not so much the predestination part. They like the idea that God's predestined them, but they do not like the idea that God has fitted vessels of wrath for destruction. They don't like the idea that these are men before of old ordained to this condemnation. These men were born to be taken and destroyed there in 2 Peter 2 and 12. They were made to be taken and destroyed. Their eyes are full of sin. Their eyes are full of adultery. They cannot cease from sin. Their, their wells are without water. Their clouds that are carried about with the tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. They don't like that idea because I believe they think that might be them. That's why they think that. How do you know you're elect? You've been elected to obedience in the sprinkling of blood. A blood baptism is a martyrdom. And if you are, if you are interested, I have people here. They will say, I've been so wicked and so evil and I just don't think God loves me enough to take me to heaven. So when I get to hell, I'm going to preach to everybody there and tell them about the truth. I said, well, if you want to, I say, if you want to tell them the truth in hell, then you're not going to hell. Yeah, that's right. But how many people here wonder at times whether you're a believer or not? Dave, are you here? Look at this. Everybody's, everybody is concerned about whether they're a believer or not. It's not how you feel that determines if you're a believer. It doesn't, whether you feel like you're a believer doesn't have anything to do with whether you're a believer. It's whether you have a hunger for this book and you want to do it, but you know you can't, but you need to do it, but you know you can't, but you need to do it, but you know you can't, but you need to do it, but you know you can't, but you need to. So a little at a time, God changes every one of us. I'll tell people, I, Dave goes out with me a lot, and I'll tell him, well, I've seen, I've seen you change. Well, I'm glad you can see me change. I hadn't seen me change at all. I said, well, I see you change. I tell Mary, and I see you change. I tell some of you, I've seen Mary change tremendously because I live with her. I said, it's kind of like a little kid. I said, what you're trying to tell me, Dave, is a little kid goes in front of the mirror and says, I can't see me growing. Well, I can see him growing. <laughs> You may not see yourself growing, but you are if you're into truth all the time. And the more you're into truth and the hungrier you are, 
And the more you listen to truth, and the more you come to church, and the more you watch the DVDs, and the more you watch the TV, and the more you get on the internet, and the more you study, the stronger you get, and you think you're not growing much, and you're growing tremendously. Yeah. I've watched everybody here change. And everybody here is wondering if they're going to go to heaven, including me. I'm wondering, God, are you just going to let me preach these things and then send me to hell one day? Because you know what makes you know that, what makes you feel that way? You have an inner man that makes the outer man recognize how wicked he is. And the, you think, God won't let my, this outer man go to heaven. Well, he certainly won't. He'll change it and give it a new body. Yeah. That's what makes us feel this way, and that's everybody. We all feel that way. Huh? We, see we see ourselves for what we are when God shines his, his wonderful everlasting light upon us. When we see, when we, this shines upon our hearts. Now, I want us to look at the 53rd chapter of I and look at it in detail. But it begins in verse 53. If this 53rd chapter is not talking about Jesus, I want to know who is it talking about? Well, the Jews say it's talking about Israel. Or they say it's talking about a second Isaiah. But it's talking about the servant of God that's suffering, and it starts in this verse 13 of 52. Notice they put a little marker there that makes it look like it's starting a new thought. It's not actually. But it says, Behold, my servant shall deal prudently. He shall be exalted and extolled and be very high. Now that word exalted is the word room, R-U-W-N. Now here's why it's not Israel. Be high. High. That's what it means. And be exalted and be extolled. And the word extolled, nasah, means to lift up. Nasah, N-A-C-A-H. N-A-C-A-H. To be lifted up. Now, this cannot possibly be Israel or anybody else. The Bible says... Six things that God hates in the sixth chapter of Proverbs, and seven is an abomination to God. And the first thing on the list is a proud look. God hates men that have a proud look. Proud is the word room, to be high. Well, that this suffering servant that's going to suffer for sin in the 53rd chapter cannot possibly be men because high and lifted up is a term reserved for Jehovah only. Even here in the Isaiah, 50, Isaiah, the, Isaiah the 6th chapter. Look here. Isaiah the 6th chapter. When you're talking about high and lifted up. It's only Jehovah. No one else. In verse 1, In the year that King Uzziah died, I saw also the Lord sitting upon a throne high and lifted up. When man is lifted up, he's going to be cut down and brought low. The suffering servant of God cannot possibly be Israel and it cannot possibly be a second Isaiah. That's reserved for God only. And look over here in Isaiah 33. Isaiah 33. And verse 10. This is talking about Jesus. 33 and verse 10. Now will I rise, saith the Lord. Now will I be exalted. Now will I lift up myself. High and lifted up is the servant of God here in the 52nd chapter. And look at 57 and, and 15. Look at 57. 57. And 15. 57 and 15. For thus saith the high and lofty one. That belongs to God only. Thus saith the high and lofty one that inhabiteth eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place with him that is also of a contrite and humble spirit. The holy place is the inner sanctuary, and that's us. We are the sanctuary of God. We're the house of God. That was called God's house. And Christ is the son of his own house. Whose house are we? 
So to revive the spirit of the humble, to revive the heart of the contrite ones. But God says, I'm the only one that's high and lifted up. Now go back over here to the 52nd chapter of Isaiah. Behold, my servant shall, be, shall deal prudently in verse 13 of chapter 52. He shall be extolled and, ex, and ex, he shall be exalted and extolled. He shall be high and lifted up and be very high. So the suffering servant, the servant of God, notice the pronouns, he. Now look on down at verse 14. And as many were astonished at thee, his visage, Mareh, M-A-R-E-H, view. His view or his appearance or shape was so marred more than any man. Misgoth is the word marred means disfigured, M-I-S-C-H-A-T-H, M-I-S-C-H-A-T-H, disfigurement. He is going to be disfigured more than any man. And I'm sure this is speaking of his being beaten because it's going to talk about his being beaten and suffering for our sins. He's atoning for our sins. This 53rd chapter of Isaiah is about atonement. So shall he sprinkle many nations. We're elected unto obedience in Second in First Peter 1 and 2. We're elected to the sprinkling of blood. And the Ark of the Covenant was sprinkled. And our hearts are sprinkled now in Hebrews 12, 22. Or 10, 22. And the king shall shut their mouths at him. For that which had not been told them shall they see. And that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report? Who believes the witness of God? And to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Who's he going to fight for? To reveal an arm meant to take your sword arm and, and tie your sleeve up. And they would tie it up. And who is he going to wield a sword for and fight for? He's going to fight for his wife, the church. He only... He only reveals his arm. In fact, look over here. Let me show you something. Look over here in Deuteronomy 33. Look at 33. Deuteronomy 33. Look here in verse 26. Oops, I flipped to the wrong book. 33, verse 26. There is none like unto thee, God of Jeshurun, another name for Israel, who rideth upon the heaven in thy help, and is the excellency on the sky. The eternal God is thy refuge, and underneath are the everlasting arms of Jesus. He is the one that holds us up with his everlasting arms. He reveals his arm for his wife, nobody else only. And he shall thrust out the enemy from before thee and shall say, destroy them. He's not going to say to the enemy, would you like to accept me as your personal Savior? He's not going to say, would you like to pray this prayer? Jesus didn't invite the Pharisees to pray a prayer. They said, how long will you make us to doubt? If you're the Christ there in John 10, why don't you tell us plainly? He said, I told you. I told you already, and I said that the reason you can't hear me, the reason you don't believe me is you can't hear me. You don't belong to me. Get away from me. My sheep hear my voice, and you can't hear, because the hearing ear and the seeing eye, the Lord hath made even both of them. You can't hear me. Get away from me. He didn't want the Pharisees. There would be a Pharisee here and there. There would be Nicodemus, and he believed God. But when it came to the Pharisees as a whole, he wasn't trying to save the Pharisees or the leaders of the Jewish nation. They didn't belong to him. They weren't part of the elect. Oh, they were Abraham's seed. They were his sperma. But they did not belong to God. Jesus said, just because you're Abraham's seed, he said, we're children of Abraham by faith. And God has to gift us with faith and put it in our hearts because we don't have it on our own. Faith is death to self, and you can't die to self when you don't seek God. If he doesn't, how is a man saved then? 
Well, God picks you out before the foundation of the world and he puts you on this journey and this path and you're on this journey and you're born here and you live to this point and you move over here and you go over here and, and somewhere along the way you go over here and you go to college over here and then you move to this city and get your job up here and then you end up marrying over here and you're riding down the road one day and you hear radio or you, or you hear some preacher and he reads something out of the Bible and, you, and it cuts into your heart and you don't have anything to do with it and you didn't do anything about making these plans to get you to that point to hear the truth and all of a sudden it makes you alive and you come alive and you didn't have anything to do with it and you say I believe and the belief didn't come from you it was a gift to God that was put in your heart you have to believe but you can't believe you have to call upon God but you can't call on God because how shall they call on him in whom they've not believed and you can't believe on your own you don't conjure up faith or belief. Faith is the noun, belief is the verb. You don't conjure that up in your heart. How are men saved? Men are saved because God wants them and he goes after them. And if he doesn't come after us, we won't go after him. So we don't know him. The way you're saved is by God's choice and God's arrangement. And he comes to you one day. You give invitation hymns all day long and nobody's going to come that don't belong to God. Besides that, invitation hymns don't mean anything. We don't do that here. That's, did that ever occur to anybody besides me? What are they doing this for? Why is it this? Why can't God deal with you back here in your seat? Why can't he deal with you down there uh, at the grocery store? Why can't he deal with you riding down the road? Why does he have to have a church with an invitation him and somebody whispering to the microphone, Just as I am without one plea. Does that mean anything? Nothing. I hate that song. I hate, I hate. Softly and tenderly, Jesus. You got to do it like that because the Holy Spirit can't work on you unless you're talking in a whisper. Holy Spirit won't talk to you when you're talking like this. Isn't that ridiculous? It's dumb. Now, I hope you preachers heard that. I'm looking to the camera. Stop that! It's Roman Catholicism is what it is. It's walking down the aisle and accepting the Eucharist. That's where it comes from. And Christ was supposed to be present in the Eucharist. You know what that does. That ups all that does is get you all upset. You think they're doing something. You can't figure it out, and you're trying to figure out, what is this they're doing? I, I feel like I need to go down there because he said so, and that, that, that emotional music is making me feel bad. Is that me? Am I, what's wrong with me? Nothing. It's that dumb preacher doing that. He got it from somebody else, and that preacher got it from somebody else, and he got it from somebody else, and he got it from somebody else. And they've been doing this. All right, now. Let's get on down in here. So shall he sprinkle many nations. The kings shall shut their mouths at him. For that which they have been told them shall they see, and that which they had not heard shall they consider. Who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? For he, that's a pronoun. Pronouns take the place of nouns, and they refer back to an antecedent. Antecedent. An antecedent is a pronoun, he, that refers back to either a noun or a pronoun. Noun or pronoun. A noun is a person, place, or thing. Person, place, thing. Thing. Now the pronouns, all the pronouns are, these are all the pronouns in a nutshell. They have variations, but here are the pronouns. I. I learned this 1955 in English class. I hadn't forgot it. I. We. You. He. She. It. They. That's it. Now you have possessive pronouns. You have my, my, mine which is a form of I, actually, we, uh, ours. You also have us, which would be a form of we, us, 
ours. Uh, you have you, yours, yours. And then you have he, his. This is possessive, this is possessive, this is possessive. This means this is something you own. The noun takes place, of a, uh, pronoun takes place of a noun. She, hers, hers. Uh, it, you usually have, that's neuter gender. Neuter, that means it's not male or female. They, theirs. Theirs. And in an apostrophe goes between the R and the S if if it's if it's possessive if it's possessive if it shows it's being possessed other than if it's a apostles it's it is uh, when you when you have apostles and it's plural possessive the apostrophe goes after the end of the word if it's plural possessive and ends in an s you put the apostrophe after the end of the word if i said jesus well, no, it wouldn't, it wouldn't go there. Uh, if you say apostles or if you say uh, any, any plural noun with an S on the end of it, you put the apostrophe there. T-H-E-I-R-S. Or you'll have an apostrophe that goes with, apostrophe that goes with a contraction. There. You can, you'll have there. That's they are. That's the same as they are. T H E Y R E, there, or yours, or uh, you get into apostrophes whenever you get into, into possessive. So whenever you get into possessive, they, it's theirs. You get into she or he, his, she, hers, you, yours, we, ours. I, my, or mine. These are all possessive. It means you own something. You possess it. Now, when, the reason I'm giving you this is because we're going to see this down here in this chapter. There is a punishment that is ours. We own it. And Jesus had to bear this punishment that was ours. And we were supposed to suffer the punishment for our sin, but he did it instead. Therefore, he was our substitute. He substituted for us on the cross. We were supposed to die for our sin, but when he said, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He was dying in our place. We deserve death for our sin. Mary and I, went, Mary and I were laying in the bed the other night, and evidently she had been thinking about this real hard. And she just started crying, weeping. She turned to me and she said, I, I can't believe he died for me, that he, that he didn't deserve this. She said, I was thinking about this. And if you really stop and think about it, like she was thinking about it, and it really touched her heart just laying there in bed thinking about how he died for me. He died in my place instead of me dying, instead of me going to hell. And some will say, yes, but he was only on the cross. He should have gone to hell forever if he died for us. You cannot put a measure on the wrath of God when he was on the cross saying, my God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? He died as an atonement for my sin in my place instead of me dying. We weren't standing at the side being observers saying, well, there he is dying for me. Kind of like in my place, but I'm not... I'm just kind of an observer of his death. No, I should have been there. If you stop and realize how wicked your sin is, and Jesus is a completely innocent man, and he died in your place. He died for you as a part of his wife, the church. Atonement has to do with predestination. That's what it's got to do with. Because it was limited. Was the atonement... On the day of the atonement, the tenth day of the seventh month, was it limited to the people in Israel? Absolutely it was. It wasn't given to anybody else out here. Their eyes were blinded until Acts 2, and God says, I'm going to open the minds of certain elect Gentiles, but not all the Gentiles. When he says, 
He is willing that all, he would that all men be saved. All men means red, yellow, white, black, and brown men because he's got a people among those people that are his elect family, and they're going to be they've been elected to obedience in the sprinkling of blood. Now let's continue reading here. For he in verse two, he is a reference back to his visage in verse fourteen. Anywhere you find he before this, and it's a reference back to my servant in verse 13 of chapter 52. You can't just come up and say he, he, is, he needs an antecedent. Every, every pronoun has to have an antecedent. It's the noun or pronoun it refers back to. You don't walk up to somebody and say, you know, he uh, jumped over the fence and uh, ran off with that uh, bushel of apples. Oh, hey, what do you mean, hey? You just don't start a conversation that way. You have to be talking about someone. Jim went to the store. He bought a loaf of bread. He is a reference back to Jim. Jim's the antecedent of he. That's what it's talking about. So when you've got he in verse 2, it's referring back to his visage in verse 14. It's referring back to he in verse 13. It's referring back to my servant in verse 13. So we're talking about the servant who is the high and lifted up Lord, aren't we? Remember that? Yeah. Only God is high and lifted up. Man is not allowed to be high and lifted up. God will cut you down when you're high and lifted up. God says, I am the only high one. He shall grow up before him, before God. He shall grow up before him that sent him, before God as a tender plant and as a root out of dry ground. Mary brought forth the son, and she was a virgin. The ground was dry inside her womb. She had not known a man, and she had a virgin-born son. This this has to be Christ being the servant that's going to be suffering and it is the it's the servant but it's also God the Father and remember Jesus said in Matthew the 18th chapter the man that is servant of all is greatest in the kingdom and he tells his apostles in John 13 I'm washing your feet I want you to learn to do the same for one another of course the foot washing came out of the that's one of the rituals that was nailed to the cross with Christ and they washed one another's feet because they wore sandals in that heat. And they washed their feet to do the lowliest task so that, those, so that Jesus said, I want you to see what you need to do with one another. Do the lowliest task. So Jesus was a servant to us. And as a root out of dry ground, that's virgin birth, he hath no form nor comeliness. Comely means beautiful, fit in real well. He didn't fit in with society, and we don't fit in with society. He didn't fit in with the Pharisees. He only fit in with the poor and the needy and the orphans and the, and the harlots that were elect. That's all he would fit in with. He hath no form nor comeliness. It's the same word as form in verse 14 of the previous chapter. It's a word that means his appearance. T-O-A-R his appearance, nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there's no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men. Now, if we're predestined to be like Christ, we're going to be despised and rejected of this world. We're going to be hated by the world, John 15 says, starting in verse 18. We're going to be persecuted. The world's going to hate us for saying Christmas is pagan, Easter's pagan, God doesn't love everybody. You have to take your cross and die daily or you can't be a disciple of Christ, you can't be his follower. You're going to go to hell without a daily cross. You tell people these truths and you're going to be despised and rejected just like he was. He was a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. The word sorrow is makob, M-A-K-O-B. He was a man of affliction. He was being afflicted by the world. And if we belong to him, I don't know who the Jews, they come up and try to make this 
another Isaiah, they try to make it Israel. It doesn't fit Israel. If they're... When Isaiah is preaching, he's talking about Israel being carried away into captivity and God calling his people by another name, which is Gentile church. And Israel is going to pay their own dues over there in Babylon. It can't be talking about Israel. They're not the high and lifted up. They're not allowed to be high and lifted up in the eyes of God. Neither are you and I. The suffering servant is the high and lifted up one. That has to be Jesus, doesn't it? I don't know how in the world a Jew can read this and get anything other than Jesus out of it. See, the Jews do not believe that Jesus is God. They do not believe he's God in the flesh. They laugh and make fun of that. That Al Franken running for, used to be a comedian on the, I saw him on a TV program the other day and he's laughing at Jesus being, calling himself God, making fun of him. Al Franken is going to hell one day. Jew or not. He's a Jew, but he's going to hell. I don't believe Al Franken ever going to believe God. He's running for political office now. And he's just sarcastic about Jesus calling himself God, saying Jesus never said he was God, and the Bible doesn't say he's God. It certainly does. He said, before Abraham was, I am. And the Pharisees picked up stones to stone him because he said, I am the I am God of the Old Testament. Well, he is the wife of Israel. He's the husband of Israel. That's his wife. He's the husband of the church. <coughs> And he died for his church, his wife, that's all, no one else. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised and we esteemed him not. He's saying what we do when he first comes to us, we're not, we're not pleased with people looking at our God, Jesus Christ, and making fun of him and laughing at him and despising him and rejecting him. And we have a tendency, just like Peter, to be ashamed and kind of go hide or like the rest of the apostles when he was taken by the Pharisees to run and hide from the, from the enemy. And we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs. The word born is the word nasah, N-A-C-A-H. In a, he's born our griefs. These, notice our, our is a possessive pronoun. It means these are griefs that belong to us, but he took them. They're griefs that we should be bearing. Ours, possessive. They were our griefs, and he took them from us and bore them himself. He did it in our place as our substitute. He hath born, nor saw, He hath borne, he hath bore up. Also the word pardon is involved there. It means a bearer of griefs. And the word our, possessive, they belong to us, but he took them from us and bore them in our place. And griefs is the word kali, C-H-O-L-I-Y. That's the word grief. It means our calamity, our anxiety, our diseases, not literal disease, spiritual disease of sin. And he has carried our sorrows. Now, carried, cabal, means literally to carry, to labor to carry. Cabal. Carry. He has carried, he has carried our makob, M-A-K-O-W-B. It is feminine gender. Feminine gender. That means it couldn't belong to him. It wasn't something he was supposed to be bearing. It was the, it was the sorrows of the church. And the word means affliction, anguish. This affliction that he bore belonged to us. It was ours and he took it upon himself instead of us taking it on ourselves. He was a substitute in our place taking the affliction that we rightly deserved when he was beaten, when he was persecuted, when, when the, when the the soldiers, the Roman soldiers would beat him in the face. 
And vi his visage was marred beyond that of any other man. When he was beaten, and his nose and his face was busted, and he was just all his skin, he was bleeding all over, and they were beating him with the cat of nine tails. The cat of nine tails had pieces of glass and bone in it. It was a, it was a short whip. It was called a scourge, and it had nine leather strips and it had piece of glass and bone all through it and metal and little round balls lead balls and it would rip the hide off and a man that could wield that thing knew exactly how to rip his hide off where he could take the hide off of his back and expose his insides while he could see his see his his inner organs pumping and you could see the insides of a man those guys were they were like technicians with this they were artists with that scourge and he was beaten and we should have been beaten instead of him he was our substitute in our place we deserve that and more he hath carried he hath carried our sorrows yet we did esteem him stricken smitten of God and afflicted. This word stricken means it's the word nega means to strike with blows. N E G A stricken. And notice this. Notice this. He was stricken, smitten of God. God did the smiting. How could that be? I thought the Romans were beating him. They were. Jesus said, nobody takes my life from me in John 10. He said, I lay my life down. God arranged the thoughts of those evil men to do their evil deeds. And Pilate was there that day, according to the fourth chapter of, of Acts. And Herod was there. And they were making fun of Christ, and Herod was putting a crown on his a crown of thorns on his head, and the soldiers were saying, Hail King of the Jews. And they were beating him, and they were scourging him, and they were buffeting him in the face, saying, Okay, prophet, prophesy, who hit you? They had him blindfolded when they'd say that. And that's what you and I deserve for our sin. The reason he died was to die instead of us dying. The reason he was punished and smitten was so that we didn't have to be beaten and punished. That's why the word smitten, naka, means to strike or beat or give wounds or to kill or to slaughter in A-K-A-H. Those were our afflictions that he took on himself. They belonged to us. They were ours. We possess them. We own those afflictions. And he said, I'm taking them instead of you. I am your substitute in this situation. He died on a cross instead of us dying in hell forever. That's why he died. Has anybody ever been riding down the road or sitting at your house saying, why did Jesus have to die? Because you deserve to. That's why. And he only died for the people that he reveals himself to that can hear and see. That's the only ones he died for. Let's read on here. He was wounded. He was stricken, smitten of God. And he was afflicted. The word afflict is the word ana. Remember that word? Afflict the soul. Ana. That's the same word you find. This has to do with atonement. Remember on the Day of Atonement, they would afflict the soul, and that was the fast. They afflicted the soul. Afflict the soul. In Leviticus, the 16th chapter, on the Day of Atonement, that afflict the soul, the word is on not. It means to humble self. He humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross that we deserved. If you don't believe this, you really don't know how bad your sin is. He was wounded. He was wounded. Kalal. 
means to break or slay or dissolve. Bore, C H A L A L. He was wounded for our. We own these transgressions. He was wounded for our Pasha rebellion. P S H A. He was wounded because, because we rebelled against God. It was for our rebellion. Our. We possessed it. Possessive pronoun. It was our rebellion. So when he was wounded for our rebellion, it was in our place instead of us being wounded. It was as a substitute in our stead. Do you realize how important this is to know this? He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. Bruised is the word daka. I love this word. He was beaten to pieces. <coughs> he was beaten to pieces for our transgressions. Now, the only reason he was beaten was because we deserved a beating. It was in our place. He was substituted for us. He was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our... Notice our. We owned it. It was our iniquities, our avon, A-V-O-N, a V O N. He was this this he was bruised for our iniquities of on our punishment. Our perversity. He was bruised. He was bruised for our punishment. Instead of us being punished, he was punished. In our place, he was punished instead of us being punished. He covered all of our sin. The sin before we become a believer and the sin after we're a believer. He didn't die just for the sin after we become a believer. He died for all the sin of our life, all the sin of all the elect, of all the body, of all the church, of all time. And the church began in the Garden of Eden. That's where it was. These were God's called out people. If he died for his wife, the church, and these dispensationalists say, well, the church is only New Testament, New Testament here, and uh, the Old Testament is not in the church, then he didn't die for Abraham, he didn't die for Isaac, he didn't die for Jacob, he didn't die for Noah, he didn't die for all the righteous men, he didn't die for Jeremiah, he didn't die for Isaiah. Unless they're in the church, they have to be in the church if he died for his wife. If he bought his wife, don't they have to be in the church? And Stephen stood in Acts the seventh chapter and he said, This prophet that men will hear, which is Christ, he was in the church in the wilderness. The church was Israel. Ecclesia, the called out. I don't even understand people saying Israel is not the church and the church is not Israel. But to me, that's insane. It's not all of Israel. It's not all of literal Israel. It's those that are elect and believers in Israel. Remember, when, when Moses left Egypt, they got out here in the wilderness and a whole bunch of people started murmuring against him and Aaron and said, you brought us out here to die. God says, because of your murmurings, I'm going to make you wander in the wilderness till I kill off all these unbelievers yeah. that are Israelites. That's why they're not all Israel which are of Israel. Only the election will obtain this and everybody else is blinded. And God is the God of this world that blinds men's eyes. He said, I'll blind their eyes. They can't see and they can't hear. Now, he says, He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. If we're going to have any peace at all, he was chastised in order that we may have peace.
with God. Remember, atonement means to make reconciliation or bring two back into one. The word atonement was invented by Mr. Tyndale. It means at one meant means to bring together into one and that's the very meaning of the word peace E-I-R-E-N-E -E. in the New Testament Irene means to bring together into one it means to reconcile pieces means to break up it means to scatter abroad but P-E-A-C-E -E means to gather together into one now, let's continue reading here. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. This is our peace, and with his stripes we are healed. Rafa doesn't mean physically healed. All the context of this is about our transgressions and our sins. This doesn't have anything to do with physical healing. The word Rafa means to mend or to stitch up or to cure. As a physician would cure, R-A-P-H-A, R-A-P-H-A. It's talking about a physician healing us. Jesus, the great physician, has come to call sinners, not the righteous, to repentance. He's come to heal us spiritually. So with his kabura, C-H-A-B-B-U-W-R-A-H, C-H-E-B-B-U-W, C-H-A-B-B-U-W-R-A-H. That word stripes, cobra, means blueness or bruise. Or it means black and blue. That's what it means. So with his beating, we are healed spiritually. All we like sheep have gone astray. Every one of the sheep, he's only dying for the sheep, his wife, the church, isn't he? Isn't that true? He says, my sheep hear my voice and they know me. Goats don't hear my voice. That's the Pharisees. That's the most of the world. That's the many that are going into the broad way. Few will come into the narrow way. Few will go through tribulation. That's because I'll put it in their minds and their hearts and they will hear me. And everyone is going after his own way. And the Lord hath laid on him. The word laid is the word paga. Remember that word? Intercession. To impinge. Intercession. This is not something you do. You cannot intercede for somebody. It's the Holy Spirit that intercedes. Intercession is the word E-N-T-U-G-C-H-A-N-O. In the New Testament, it means to impinge progress. The Lord hath laid upon Christ. Here's the way it is. Here's what God has done. To impinge progress. God is going, God the Father is coming to us to punish us for our sin. Unless something stops that punishment and moves it another direction and takes on that punishment. When if you're riding down the road and you're coming up to this intersection and you see a car coming and you see a little kid crossing the street right here and that car is flying, you know this kid is trying to walk across the street, it looks like it's not going to stop and you're in your car and you hit that car and impinge its progress and knock it off the path that it's headed for and God's wrath is headed towards us and God has impinged his wrath upon Christ he has diverted that wrath another direction so we won't be hit by the wrath of God. That's what he's talking about. That's what atonement is. 
You were the target of God's wrath, and so was I. And those that are not elect of God, and they're not in the body and the wife of Christ, they're going to suffer the wrath of God. For some reason, people do not understand that God does not, He will not assuage, He will not divert His wrath from someone He has not intended to redeem. And He only diverts His wrath from us because we have a substitute. That's the only reason. We have someone who has died in our place because those were our stripes, though that was our cross, that was everything that we deserve and he suffered. It was instead of us. Instead of us suffering it, he took the place of us while he was beaten and scourged and persecuted and laughed at and mocked. And he was the living God. He was the suffering servant, the one that was high and lifted up. And he didn't deserve this. He was innocent. And we are all guilty, aren't we? Everybody here is guilty. Everyone here. He took upon himself your punishment, your sin, and there's not a good man upon the earth. There's not a just man that doeth good and sinneth not. Now some of you look like gentle, quiet, nice people, not quite like me and Mary <laughs> when we get flared up. You look like you don't ever lose your temper, but you're wicked to the core. Did you know that? Look at Dan. He looks like this all-American young guy. just. But he's wicked. I know he don't mind me saying that. Some have, some have this real gentle look about you, but your heart is dark and it's filled with sin and self. But that ain't just Dan, that's every person in this room. I pick out Dan because he looks like the all-American boy. Where was I? Six? Huh? Six. All we like sheep have gone astray, every one of us. But sheep stray, don't they? Sheep are real stupid animals. They stray and they go off somewhere and they can't find their way back. They can't even find their way back to the flock if it's on a plane and the flock is in a distance. They can't even find their way back to the flock when they're in plain sight. They keep wandering. They're not paying attention. They have a very short attention span. They have attention deficit disorder. That's sheep. They can't pay attention to God. Did you know that? We have a hard time paying attention to God. We get so involved. We're out there eating and we're trying to eat of the things of the world. We end up off in a ditch and we become cast and our feet are straight in the air and we can't aright ourselves and we're going, oh God, what am I going to do? And the shepherd comes and says, why do you do this? Don't you know I'm here and I love you? Get on your feet here. And he turns us up and puts us on our feet and then we take off and wander around again. Sometimes he has to break our legs and carry us around for a while so we won't wonder, doesn't he? He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. <coughs> he is brought as a lamb to slaughter and as a sheep before his shears is done, so he opened not his mouth. Well, gosh, look over in Mark 15 and 3. Look at Mark 15. Who else is this but Jesus? Mark 15. I don't know how the Jews can't see this. 15 and verse 3. Jesus is being taken. Look at verse 1. And straight when in the morning the chief priest held a consultation with the elders and scribes and the whole council and bound Jesus and carried him away and delivered him to Pilate. And Pilate asked him, Art thou the king of the Jews? And he, and he answering said unto him, Thou sayest it. That means to say yes. And the chief priest accused him of many things, but he answered nothing. And Pilate asked him again, saying, Answerest thou nothing? Behold how many things they witness against thee. Look at John 19. He opened not his mouth. Who else do you think this is talking about? This is, be this is 700 years before he's born. Who else would it be talking about? 19th chapter, verse 8. When Pilate therefore heard that saying, he was more afraid 
when the Jews said he made himself the son of God in verse 7, they believed he called himself God. They kept saying it. And went again into the judgment hall and saith unto Jesus, Whence art thou? But Jesus gave him no answer. As a lamb to slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is dumb. Lambs don't make a peep. They don't talk. They don't bat or anything else. When they're about to be killed, they slit their throat, catch the blood in the in a little basin, and slay, and throw it against the altar. And the lambs don't open their mouth. And Jesus, as a lamb to slaughter, as a sheep before his shears is dumb, he didn't open his mouth. Then saith Pilate unto him, Speakest thou not unto me, knowest thou not that I have power to crucify thee, and have power to release thee? And Jesus says, I'll say one thing to you. And this is it. I'm not going to defend myself. I'm dying for my wife, the church. I'm paying for her. I'm dying in her place instead of her dying, and she's mine. He's paying a price where he owns us. And Jesus answered, Thou couldst have no power at all against me except it were given thee from above. Therefore he that delivered unto thee unto me unto thee hath the greater sin. And from thenceforth Pilate sought to release him about. But the Jews cried out, saying, If you let this man go, you're not Caesar's friend. We're going to tell him on you. Caesar had enough trouble with the Jews as it was. Whoever maketh himself a king speaketh against Caesar. You better tell him that, Pilate. You're going to be in trouble not only with us, but with Caesar. Pilate didn't want to get sent off to Alaska somewhere, <laughs> stationed up there, you know. And he will be. He opened not his mouth, verse 8 of chapter 53. He was taken from prison and from judgment. Just like Joseph, wasn't he? Sold by his brothers. Who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. He died, but not for himself. He died for us. He died in our place. For the transgression, the pisha, the rebellion of my people was he nega. Suffer affliction or blows or strokes. It was for our is the transgression he for for the transgression of my people was he stricken he made his grave with the wicked and the rich in death look at Matthew 27 look at Matthew 27 who else would this be talking about Matthew 27 how much time do i have huh I've got to get on here. Matthew 27. In verse 57. And when the evening was come on the day that Jesus died, there came a rich man of Arimathea named Joseph, who also himself was Jesus' disciple. And he went to Pilate and begged the body of Jesus. Notice he was a rich man. It says he was a rich man. There in verse 57. Then Pilate commanded the body to be delivered, and when Jesus had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb. When Joseph, not Jesus. When Joseph had taken what? You said Jesus. No, did I say Jesus? When Joseph had taken the body, he wrapped it in a clean linen cloth and laid it in his own new tomb which had been hewn out in the rock, and he rolled a great stone to the door of the sepulchre and departed. Jesus was buried with the rich, wasn't he? Because he was poor, and he didn't have any money. And back to, back to Isaiah 53. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence... Neither was any deceit or guile or trickery in his mouth. And he left us that same testament. He bequeathed us that no guile would be in our mouth in that second chapter of 1 Peter. Down in about verse 22. No guile was in his mouth. No guile is to be in our mouths. No, guile means to live by trickery, to speak trickery. Guile is the word dolos in the Greek. D O L O S. Back here in in Isaiah. 
There was no deceit in his mouth. I think this sounds like Jesus, doesn't it? How in the world a Jew can read this since it's in the Old Testament and it's not in the New and Jesus hadn't been born yet and not know it's about him? I don't know. Because it can't... This is the high and lifted up one that is the servant of God the Father. That's who it is. It's about Jesus. The high and lifted up is not Israel. It's not Isaiah. It's not any, it's not any human being. Is it? Can't be the human beings. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. God does whatsoever he pleases. And that word bruise, naka, we've already said, means to beat two pieces. It pleased God to beat him and to put him on the cross so he could die for his wife, his body, the church, and be in our place. He only took the place of his wife. This is concerning Israel only. It's the Day of Atonement. It's the Day of Atonement over here in the Old Testament with that temple, isn't it? And it pleased the Lord to bruise him, to beat him to pieces. Herod was there. Pilate was there. The Jews were there screaming, crucify him. And the Roman soldiers were piercing his side and they were therefore to do whatsoever thy hand and thy counsel determined before to be done. God determined before. The word determined before is proho-rizzo. It's predestinate. God predestinated Jesus to be murdered by these religious preachers. He predestined Jesus' murder for you in your place when you deserved it and you don't deserve eternal life and neither do I. And we know how wicked our hearts are. And it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He had put him to grief. Kala, afflicted, pierced. Grief. C-H-A-L-L-A-H. Remember... One of the titles for the showbread, this is a derivative of the word C-H-A-L-L-A-H. That word kalah means pierced. That was one of the terms for the showbread. It was pierced bread. They had to pierce the bread. And we're pierced and we being many are one bread and one body. And we're pierced. So it pleased the Lord to bruise him he, speaking of the Lord, hath put the suffering servant, the high and lifted up one, to grief. God put grief upon Jesus that belonged to us. That's the whole idea of the atonement. If you atone for something, you make restitution, don't you? If you do somebody wrong and cheat them, you say, I'm going to atone for that. You have to go and reconcile yourself to them by paying the debt. That's owed. Jesus paid a debt that we owed and could not pay. Didn't he? You want to know why Jesus died? This is why he died. He died because he picked you out before the foundation of the world and he arranged your life to hear the truth and he opened your ear, your spiritual ear, and he made you alive in your heart and you didn't have anything to do with it. And he says, now you're going to live for me. You're going to live right, you're going to live righteous, and you're godly, and you're going to say, I don't feel like doing it. He says, that don't matter, I'll beat you long enough till you will. Get your mind right, that's right. Yet it pleased the Lord to beat him to pieces. It pleased God. God is the one that did this. God the Father. He arranged it all. He had put him to grief when thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin. That's what the atonement was. It was an offering of sin for the people. The word offering for sin is one word. It's the word asham. A-S-H-A-M. It means a guilt or a fault or a sin offering. A-S-H-A-M. That's what that offering was on the Day of Atonement. Inside this, when he came in, that was an offering for sin. That was a sin offering on the Day of Atonement. He atoned for our sin. This is talking about atonement here, isn't it? When he sprinkled that Ark of the Covenant, he sprinkles our hearts, and we have the broken law inside of our hearts because we broke it. And he says, now you have to die for it. Now you have to pay for it. Oh, you don't want to pay, and you're my elect. I have provided a sacrifice. Sacrifice means to give up something that you don't want to give up. 
there is a sacrifice that we have to make for sin. Instead of us dying, you make the atonement or the sacrifice. Where was I? Off, made his soul an offering for sin. He shall see his seed. He shall prolong. He shall prolong his days. The word prolong. The word prolong. Arak. Arak means to live long. You know what that word prolong is talking about? He's going to prolong his days. They're going to take his days away from him, but he's going to prolong his days. What's he going to do? Resurrect from the dead. That's, that word prolong is a picture of, of him extending his days by resurrecting, extending his days. It means to live long. When you live long, he's going to resurrect even though he's cut off out of the land of the living. Isn't he? Prolong is a picture of resurrection. He shall prolong his days in the pleasure of the Lord. God says, I do what I please. Our God sits in heaven. He's done whatsoever he hath pleased. And the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in the hand of God. Prosper. Prosper means to push forward. Salak. T-S-A-L-A-C-H. T-S-A. L-A-C-H. It means to move forward. He's going to move forward in this whole situation. He shall see. He shall see of the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied. The Father shall see the travail of the soul of the Son, the, ser the suffering servant, and shall be satisfied. And the Father will be sabah. He will be satisfied. He will fill to the full. And it will be enough sacrifice. It will be enough sacrifice when he fills to the full. Sabah. It is a derivative of the word seven. He's going to seven himself. He's going to say, I am completely satisfied with the death of my son instead of the death of each one of my elect. And he's going to be satisfied. He shall see the travail of his soul and shall be satisfied by his knowledge and shall my righteous servant justify many. Not all. He's going to ransom many, the scripture says. He's going to justify Sodal, be right or cleanse or clear self. He's going to clear the guilt. Atonement means to cover guilt. He's going to cover your guilt instead of you covering it. You can't cover it. You, the difference between you and Christ, he's without sin and he can cover the guilt with his blood. But even if you go to hell, you'll never cover your guilt. Your guilt will never be covered. You cannot compare his blood being shed and spread upon your heart you can't compare that with your death in hell forever because there is no atonement in hell. When he atones, he atoned on the cross just like the lamb was, the blood of the goat was sprinkled upon the altar. And when he said, my God, my God, that's the moment he took upon himself the sins of all of his elect. He didn't die for everybody. He died for his wife, the church. All the elect of all time, that's when he atoned or he justified us and he shall bear the iniquities of his wife. Iniquities is the word punishment. He's bearing the punishment. The punishment that we deserve. Therefore I will divide with him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong, because he hath poured out his soul unto death, became obedient to the death, even the death of the cross. And he was numbered with the transgressors. One on each side of him, wasn't he? Who else is this but Jesus? It's the high and lifted up one. It's Christ, the Jehovah of the Old Testament. He came and died in our place and substituted for the punishment that belonged to us. It was our punishment that he took upon himself. That's a substitute. Propitiation means substitute. 
with the transgressors, and he bare, nor saw, carried the sin. The, the, that word sin, cat, means penalty. He carried the penalty that belonged to us. Cat. He bore the sins of many and made intercession, Pogal, impinged for the transgressor. He impinged the wrath of God and drove it away so that we don't have to suffer this. Do you know why Jesus died now? It's because you deserve to die. And I deserve to die. And I deserve the beating that he took. But mainly, when he cried, My God, my God, I deserved hell. And simply by his grace, grace, charis, means unmerited favor, did he die in my place. God just picked me out and he picked you out if you're elect before the foundation of the world and said, this is mine. I'm buying him. I'm buying her. It's all the church. It's all the one body. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word, for your truth. Help us to understand that what you did for us is so unfathomable. Lord, make this register on the hearts of the people here so they can see why you died. That you died because you loved us before we loved you. You knew us before we, we knew you. And you revealed yourself to your wife, your church, your body, your family. Thank you for your truth. God, crush us under your hand and cause us to be understand what you did. Lord, we can't grasp it all. Humble our hearts before you. And we'll praise you and glorify you for all things. God, I, I, I don't even know what to say sometimes. Sometimes it strikes my heart and I just... Lord, it humbles me to realize that you picked me and I didn't have anything to do with it. Thank you for truth. In Christ's name we pray, man.